Hello everyone. So today we're going to talk about continuity. Most of the things we're going to talk about today are theorems, bits of theory that will be useful a little later down the line. It's not extremely useful in the computational sense, maybe a little bit in computing limits, but um, mainly these are just results that will have a strong connection to what we want to do in the setup for dealing with differentiable functions. So first of all, let's talk about our definition of continuity. So sort of following the way that it's typically done in a calculus course, we'll first talk about what we mean for a function f to be continuous just at a point, z0. The short and sweet definition of continuity at the point z0 is just to say that when you take the limit as z approaches z0 of the function f of z, you can evaluate that limit by direct substitution. So it would be f of z0. In situations where you have to prove things about continuity, it sometimes comes down to falling all the way back to the epsilon and delta definition of limit. So since continuity is defined in terms of a limit, we can put it in terms of epsilon and delta too. So another way to say f is continuous at z0 is to say f is continuous at z0 if, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that for all complex numbers, if, now see, because the function f is defined at z0, then we could just write the inequality about the neighborhood of z0 this way. So modulus of z minus z0 just needs to be less than delta, but we do not have to have that that inequality is greater than zero because z can equal z0 here. But if that inequality is satisfied, then the inequality modulus f of z minus f of z0 is less than epsilon. So what I hope you're seeing in this definition here is that it's just that in the original definition of limit, w0 is our f of z0. And so we're just putting um, w0 in the place of, or we're putting f of z0 in the place of w0 in the definition of limit. And you know also we don't have to have this inequality here where the modulus of z minus z0 does not have to be positive. But basically it's just the definition of limit. And then we also say a function f can be continuous on a region. It just means that it's continuous to all the points in that region. You know, in calculus one, you kind of introduce continuity very gently, and you talk about how, you talk about it in terms of the graph of the function. You say, well, the function is continuous. That just means that you can graph it without ever having to lift your pencil, or that there's no break or jump in the graph. And I guess that's kind of true with com complex functions, but their graphs are so complicated you have to think of them as four-dimensional objects or you know we had these before and after pictures um, there's not really a nice way to put it I mean there's certainly something abrupt that changes at a point where a function is not continuous and we'll see that that happens a little later in what we call branch cuts of like root functions and logarithms and things like that so on the basis of this definition because it's defined in terms of limits we get a bunch of things just almost immediately for free if we know f and g are both continuous at z0, then we can say like f plus g is continuous at z0. We can do f times g is continuous at z0. We can do the ratio f over g is continuous at z0, provided, of course, that the denominator is not equal to 0 at z0. So provided g of z0 is not 0, Using this and some other really basic properties of limits, like the limit of a constant as a constant, and the limit of z as z goes to z0 is just z0, and uh, the limit of z to the n as z approaches z0 is z0 to the n, which is one of your homework problems. Using basic little properties like that, along with the sum and product properties above, you can very quickly verify that any polynomial, polynomials are continuous on the whole complex plane, and rational functions are continuous everywhere they are defined. So everywhere where you don't get zero in the denominator of the polynomial. So it's almost all of the complex numbers, except for maybe a few. All the functions that we really care about at this point are continuous on their domains of definition. So theorem one tells us that when you compose continuous functions, the result is continuous. 
We do it for continuity at a point, but you can also make a similar statement for a continu continuity on a domain of a composition. But So here the setup is, is you got the function f goes from a domain d to c, and g goes from a domain r to c, and you need that the domain of g falls inside the range of f. So that's what, what this condition is about here. The output values of f have to fall in the domain of g. So then if you know f is continuous at a point z0, and then g is continuous at f of z0, then when you compose those two functions, g compose f would be continuous at z0. So this is good to know because this is how you sort of build up comp more complicated functions from simple functions, like you compose, right? So if I have a polynomial and I plug it inside of a root function, you know, I want to know is that going to be continuous? Things of that nature. All right, so let's see how to prove this. So let's start off by letting epsilon being greater than zero. Since g is continuous at f of z naught, there exists some delta greater than zero such that for every complex number, z, or let me use a different variable here, I'll, I'll say u. For every u in the complex numbers, the modulus of u minus f of z naught being less than delta implies that the modulus of g of u minus g of f of z naught is less than epsilon. I'm going to number this implication here 1, because I'll be needing to reference it soon. And then next, so we have this new positive parameter delta. So since delta is a positive parameter and f is continuous at z naught, then we know there exists some new delta, let's call it delta hat, greater than zero such that for every z and c, if the modulus of z minus z naught is less than this delta hat, that implies that the modulus of f of z minus f of z naught is less than delta. And I'm going to number this inequality, or I'm going to number this implication of inequalities here too. And so what you can do is kind of stitch these things together, one and two. So now we can say, well, if z satisfies the modulus of z minus z naught is less than delta hat, that implies, according to two, that modulus f of z minus f of z naught is less than delta. But now this inequality, f of z minus f of z naught, is an inequality of this form up here that I'm also shading in blue. See, f of z in the lower inequality in blue is just a specific instance of a u, so the implication that is true up there applies. So implication number one implies that modulus g of f of z minus g of f of z naught is less than epsilon. And that implies that the composition is continuous at the point z naught. That's the proof because if you s sort of pay attention to how it fits into the definition of continuity, we started with an arbitrary epsilon. There exists a certain delta. Delta hat is the one that's important here. And if z is within that delta hat of z naught, then it forces the composition evaluate z the composition evaluated at z minus the composition evaluated at z naught to be less than epsilon. Maybe it'd be slightly clearer if I wrote the last inequality in green there is g composed with f of z minus g composed with f of z naught there. So anyway, that, that gives you that the composition is continuous at z naught. So that's good. Compose continuous functions, you get a continuous function. The next theorem comes in handy every once in a while when you're proving something, maybe about derivatives or... So maybe th this would seem intuitive, this function would seem intuitive for a real valued function, but it just says if a function is continuous at a point and it's also not equal to zero at that point, then you know that it's not equal to zero sort of on an entire neighborhood of z naught. If this were a real valued function, it would be sort of intuitively clear. Like if you looked at the graph of a function, and here was z naught, and the function was not equal to zero at that point, 
Well, you can kind of see, it can't immediately just on either side of Z naught and jump straight down and be zero. There has to be some, because it's continuous, you can find a neighborhood around Z naught there where the, the function's not equal to zero there either. Heavily relies on the continuity property. So let's prove this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna let epsilon be equal to the modulus of f of z naught divided by two. And since we know that f of z naught is not equal to zero in the hypothesis, then we know that this is a positive quantity. And because we know that our function f is continuous at z naught and we've got a positive quantity, then we can get a delta. There exists a positive delta such that for every complex number, z, the modulus of z minus z naught being less than delta implies that the modulus of f of z minus f of z naught is less than epsilon, which we've chosen to be modulus of f of z naught divided by two. So now if z is an element of the neighborhood of z naught of radius delta such that f of z is equal to zero. See, we're wanting to establish that we have a whole neighborhood where f of z is not equal to zero, and it's this delta neighborhood of z naught that's the neighborhood in that satisfies the theorem. So for the sake of contradiction, suppose that f of z would be zero in this neighborhood. Then since z is in that neighborhood, then we know that the modulus of z minus z naught is less than delta, so we must have modulus of f of z minus f of z naught is less than modulus f of z naught divided by two. Or in other words, since we're supposing here f of z is equal to zero, this would be modulus of zero minus f of z naught is less than modulus f of z naught over two. And on the left-hand side there, that's really just modulus of f of z. And you've got modulus of f of z is less than modulus of f of z naught divided by two. So you can't have a positive quantity. That's what f of modulus of f of z naught is because we know f of z naught is not equal to zero. So its modulus is positive. A positive number can't be less than half of itself. In fact, the opposite's true. So this is a contradiction. So we know f of z does not equal to zero for every z in that neighborhood centered at z naught of radius delta. So that's pretty good to know a lot of times. There are situations where you you want to be have a guarantee that you're not going to divide by zero. So if you've got a function and you know it's not equal to zero at a point, then you know that it's not equal to zero, not just at that point, but over a whole neighborhood around that point, if you know the function's continuous. This will be something we use to keep from dividing by zero when we're proving theorems later. Okay, so the next theorem is kind of nice. So the setup is, is that you've got your function f of z and you've broken it up into its real and imaginary function parts. And you've got a particular point z naught here that we can write as an ordered pair, z naught y, x naught y naught. What this theorem says is that the function f would be continuous at z naught if and only if its component functions are continuous at that point, x naught comma y naught. So what this does is it translates the question of continuity of a complex function onto the component functions, which are real valued functions. So then you can use anything you learned back in multivariate calculus class about continuous functions, and there's a lot to help you out. This is gonna be one of your homework exercises to prove this, and the proof of it would rely on some things that you learned from a previous lesson in particular, there's a theorem that talks about when you take the limit of a function, you can uh, distribute that limit onto the component functions. And so that's a, that's a big help in proving that theorem. And the last little theorem that we want to talk, he talk about here, it's actually a really important theorem, but and this is the theorem, the analog of which you use quite heavily in calculus. You may remember in calculus class, whenever you have a function on a closed interval and you want to find its maximums and minimums, well, 
first of all, there's a theorem that's the analog of theorem four that says, hey, if the function is continuous on the closed interval a to b, then it's got to have a maximum and it's got to have a minimum. Like it doesn't somehow just go off to infinity or or just do a sort of a soft approach up to some point without ever quite reaching it. Like it has a hard maximum and a hard minimum that it attains. And of course, the way you would find that maximum and that minimum is you would, you'd, you would use the derivative to, you know, you'd get any critical points that occur in, in that interval and you would just plug your critical points and the endpoints of the interval into the original function to see what's the biggest value that you get. So anyway, this theorem that we're doing here is the analog, the, the existence part of a maximum. So it says if f is continuous on a region R that is closed and bounded. So we gave that de topological definition of what we mean by a closed set. It means that it contains all of its boundary points. And bounded just means that the set doesn't go on forever. You can put some disk around it that contains the set. So if your function f is continuous on the closed and bounded region, then there exists some maximum, cap m, such that the modulus of the function is less than or equal to m. This isn't quite the analog of ha attaining a maximum. We'll, we'll prove that sort of thing later, but at least we know that there is some sort of upper bound on the function. The function doesn't, it's impossible for the function to just go off to infinity, at least. So how can we prove this? Well, one way that we can do it is we can take advantage of theorem three, which um, allows us to translate some statement about a function of a complex variable to functions of two real parameters, real valued functions. Let's start off just by letting f of z equal modulus or equal um, u of x comma y plus i times v of x comma y. By a fact from complex or by a fact from multivariate calculus, u of x y and v of x y have upper bounds. Let's say m1 and m2 on that region R on which they're defined. So the region R here, we can think of it as just a subset of the of the plane R squared, you know, the the real two-dimensional plane of ordered pairs x comma y. So these two functions u and v here, they're just real-valued functions, and they're taking these two real-valued parameters, and it's, and if they're continuous. We know by the previous theorem that the u and the v there are continuous functions because f was continuous. So we've got continuous fun real valued functions of two, per two parameters on this region r, so they have to have upper bounds, m1 and m2. Thus, you know, if we would take the modulus of f of z, that's the modulus of u of x comma y plus i times v of x comma y. Well, u of x comma y and v of x comma y um, we can just treat as complex numbers for a moment, and we can apply the triangle inequality and say this is less than or equal to modulus of u x comma y plus modulus of i times v of x comma y. And the modulus of i times v of x comma y, you can just get rid of the i. So this is modulus of u of x comma y plus modulus of v of x comma y. But when you're taking the modulus of just real valued things, it's the same thing as just absolute value. So you can just interpret this as absolute values here. And then by our fact from multivariate calculus, this would be less than or equal to m1 plus m2. This is true for every z in r, this inequality. And of course, we just then let m, the upper bound that we seek in this theorem, be m1 plus m2, and we'd be done. So you should, if you can put your hands on your old calculus book, see if you can look up the fact that we're using here. You'd have to find a theorem that says if you got a function of two variables, a real valued function of two variables defined on some closed and bound region in the plane, then it has some upper bound on that region. It is a fact though, and that's the, that's the power of this theorem three is it allows you to a lot of times take advantage of stuff that's already proven for functions of real variables, rather than having to reinvent the wheel of how it was proved already in the, the real setting. Okay, so, this is all I have for you on continuity. Next up, we'll start talking about derivatives.
All right. Talk to you soon. Bye now.